Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday morning, the last Tuesday in June, and the last of the Novelty Project Summer Camp Safaris. Today, we turn our attention to monarch butterflies. And this is going to be really fantastic. Our guests are Dr. Ellen Sharp and Joel Moreno, coming to us from Macheros, Mexico, one of the winter sanctuaries at Cerro Pelon. Um, I'm going to, we're going to show a little piece of video here uh, to introduce them, and we're going to bring them live on in a second if technology allows. So let's watch this. This is an introduction to um, the monarch situation as a whole. A lot of people here understand that the migration starts uh, at the end of the winter in Mexico, and the super generation of monarchs fly north. There they are in the colonies all the way up to Canada, many of them, through three, four, sometimes even five generations of butterflies in a year. And then the last generation goes back to the sanctuaries and uh, for this spectacle where uh, Hoel and Ellen have a both a great JM Butterfly B&B &B and a uh, nonprofit that's dedicated to preserving and protecting this forest. Uh, we're going to see Hoel here in a moment. The internet, you'll see him in the video, and then we'll see him live. The internet is down <laughs> in Macheros, and so they've driven in their van to this is, a uh, ridge top. Well, has a fantastic, uh, and his there wife, is. Elena, have a fantastic wife, monarch uh, B&B uh, uh, down the uh, yeah. mountain in, in Macheros. It's a great place to stay, and he's a great guide. And what would you like to say? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank Turk for <laughs> what you guys doing up there in the north, you know, like planting milkweed. Uh, I think is uh, we can see the results with the butterflies. We're getting more butterflies this year. I see we have probably more than double than last year, and it feels good, you know, to have more butterflies. And and yeah, well, yeah, you guys doing your part over there in the north, and we're going to try to do our part here, you know, like which is protecting the forest. So, thank you. What a beautiful, what a beautiful, beautiful sight. Beautiful sight. Hey, and let's see if we can connect to, uh, luckily I shot that in the winter this year. Let's see if we can connect to Hoel and Ellen here. Are you guys, are you guys there, Chris? Have you got a feed from them? Hi. All right. <laughs> the wonders of technology. Um, yes. So the, sig the signal now, just to be clear with everybody, the signal you would normally be on um, oh. is, uh, from a tower that you made, but that that whole signal's down now. So you've driven it in the van. Where are you? Well, we we live on the edge of the state of Mexico. Cerro Pelon is in both state of Mexico and partially in Michoacan. Michoacan has more services than that corner of the state of Mexico. So we've driven to like 15 minutes away to the side of the road, right over the state border where there's cell phone signal. There's no cell phone signal where we live, but and there's no internet signal except for the towers Hoel built to relay the signal across the county to where we are. So usually we have internet, but there's a blackout somewhere along the line of our towers. So Ama amazing, we amazing. <laughs> we're a bit of a panic this morning trying to figure out sure. how we were going to do this. Well, yeah. thanks so much. For doing it. I'm like, man, all yeah, of Africa has better internet signal than Mexico. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was in Africa oh, probably ten years ago when there was great video footage of of the first subsea undersea cable internet cable coming from India to East Africa, and after laying the whole cable all the way across the Indian Ocean, they had about two hundred guys down in the water dragging the cable out on the beach, <laughs> and the internet immediately got better. Um, so Cerro Pelon is one of the winter sanctuaries. Um, you guys have J M Butterfly B and B. So if people want to come visit, it is the place. I have been going down there for to Mexico to see the butterflies for 30 years. And that's the place I always tell everyone is to stay with Hoel and Ellen. But you also are involved in butterfly conservation. Um, uh, how are, uh, how was the season this year before we go to the, the, the shutdown from COVID? Did you have a good butterfly season? And it looks like we might have lost signal for a second. I'll tell you what, let, let's play, Christy. Can you can you guys hear me? We, yeah. You, yeah. Want, you want to take this one? Yeah, we can talk. <laughs> no, we. Yeah, for most of the season. Yeah, you had a lot of butterflies this year? We're having a little delay. 
Yeah, you, hopefully you can hear me live and not. We're still here. No, we had a very good I, season, and and really, the virus didn't really hit until the butterflies were already flying north. Anyway, that didn't affect us this. But I think it will for the next one. Yeah, well, it's going to be tough for next year. I want to remind everybody who's watching. Thanks for tuning in. Um, please share, and if you, uh, I see yeah, we've I'm got not, comments. I'm not on already. Facebook. I'm leaning forward to read some comments. Uh, good morning, Kylie and Julianne. Oh, Julianne Holland, how about that? Um, so please, please uh, ask any questions. We'll try to get some of those. And um, it's it, uh, great to have people uh, watching with us. And it, this will stay live after. Um, the, um, the the winter months for the, to see the monarchs down there are, um, what are the ideal months in a normal season to visit? Uh, we definitely have a delay. Maybe, maybe Ellen, I tell you what, I'm going to, we're going to play a little piece of video. We've got a lot of video to show to, to keep things moving and you guys could refresh yeah, your screen. We're while having, we're we're having trouble I hearing you, but I think, yeah, we were asking about when, when this, see the butterflies, they, they are, So, so Christy, let's play the, uh, Ellen, can you guys uh, reload your page and we'll see if we'll get you better. And Christy, you could play uh, the uh, that piece of video with a little we'll short look here. at the migration. It was fine. We'll, we'll be back with you, Ellen and Joel. And okay, yeah. here it goes. And I can describe a little of this when Christy brings it up full screen. We got a lot going on at one time here. So we'll cover the northern end of the migration here for a second. This is our friend Bill Neiman at Native American Seed. Great place to, to buy seed for uh, uh, Texas and American wildflowers. And there's a Lepus viridis, uh, a milkweed plant that grows, as Bill is describing, kind of wide and low. Milkweed is the plant that monarch butterflies have to lay their eggs on. And this is a pollinator plant here. And so when they fly north out of the sanctuaries, they have to find the milkweed lay eggs so that that generation can and can hatch and move on uh, we've had uh, and speaking of hatching that is a monarch egg hatching into that tiny caterpillar they eat the milkweed that is the milkweed leaves there and there and if you put and then they of course turn into a chrysalis right before they emerge the chrysalis becomes opaque and translucent the butterfly comes out they they have to pump the liquid from their abdomen into their wings which takes a while and here's our challenge in the north. We have a very pesticide-oriented uh, agriculture system, which has wiped out a lot of pollinators and a lot of milkweed. Uh, we've plowed a lot of the prairies, uh, the fence roads. Uh, if we plant milkweeds in the north and we plant pollinators in the north, that supports the migration. And uh, here's our map that shows how they move through the spring. Uh, there is a tiny little green milkweed plant going into a butterfly garden that we planted at Westridge Middle School in Austin. Uh, we're currently working on a, about to plant a big monarch butterfly uh, and pollinator garden at a place called Dreamland, at Tank Town in uh, Dripping Springs, Texas, a really beautiful place. So um, hopefully we'll have a lot of monarch caterpillars out there uh, next uh, spring. And the monarchs uh, continue that uh, journey through these uh, generations and the one last super generation goes sometimes from as far away as Canada all the way down through the U.S. Um, we've lost a lot of bees, is what Bill's talking about here, all the way down through the U.S. and um, back to the sanctuaries where they arrive. That is at Cerro Pilon. They arrive around the Day of the Dead, around uh, the 1st of November every year. So let's see if we have Joel and Ellen back to, and able to join us. How's our timing now? Better? No. Yeah, we switch places, but it's working <laughs> again. Okay. So I just showed everybody a little bit of the migration to the north. Um, Joel, could you let, let me ask you about you're the first one there. You, you were born in Macheros, right? What is your? How did you begin with the butterflies? Uh, well, yes, I born in Macheros, and my my father he uh, he was a forest ranger, you know. So um, all my life um, I've been uh, with the butterflies, you know. 
So I went away for a little bit and I came back and it was nothing to do with Macheros, you know, so we had to figure it out something. Um, then I started to work for a hotel in Stockwell and I met Ellen and we started the business. <laughs> I don't know, like... Yeah. Well, I couldn't believe how well lived in such a beautiful place at such a beautiful sanctuary and there was no tourism infrastructure there at all. So we that's when we started the VMB to to let people actually stay there, enjoy the village and not just come on a day trip because it was really was set up kind of like cruise ship tourism where big buses right. would come. <laughs> <and> <laughs> we, were, we had good connection there for a second and we slipped out. Oh, there we go. I lost you for one second. So people uh, okay. could not just come on a day trip. Yeah. Yeah, people just came on day trips and didn't, you know, there there weren't restaurants, there weren't hotels, they didn't stay there. So it's just renting a horse for a day or a guide for a day, and it didn't really help the community a lot. So the idea has been to create more activities and try to attract people there for longer periods of time. And um, yeah, even even throughout the year, I saw one of the comments of one of our guests, Heike, who came in the off season. The off season is really beautiful, too, and there's still a lot to do. Horseback riding, cooking classes, hiking. Yeah, Maybe not it, it's beautiful year round out there. They are a guide for a day, and it didn't really help the community a lot. So the idea has been to create more activities and. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, we got a little feedback there for a second. Apologies for that. I have. I've always dreamed of of having a place. Oh, I love it. Look, you really are in your van. This is amazing. Out by the side of the road. <laughs> yeah, I <heard> <laughs> I go house shopping in, in the little town and saying, oh, I'd just love to have a place in these beautiful mountains. It's just extraordinarily gorgeous. So um, there's a the, lot of uh, Turk. I'm sorry to interrupt. Turk, I've actually lost your feed now. So uh, <laughs> when you have a chance well, while we're doing something here. else, you can pop back in. OK, yeah. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Christy, go ahead and talk if you need to. I just should be back in. Did I pop in? Here you come. And <laughs> we are hey. technology challenged today. So um, the um, the the butterflies give us a, like a really brief rundown. Hoel, tell us about um, you were telling us a little bit about about your dad. Your dad first took you up the mountain, is that right? Um. Well, yeah. Like a lot of people um, ask me, you know, uh, when was the, the first time I went to see the butterflies? And I told people, you know, like. The, I really don't remember when was the first time because um, my dad was a photo stranger, right? So I want to think or create this thing in my head that my dad put me in the back of his horse and took me to see the butterflies, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, I've been going to see the butterflies since like I was little, you know? And the other thing I want to say, you know, the when I was little, maybe like, I don't know, 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, uh, it used to be a lot of butterflies flying everywhere in Macheros, you know, like, I don't know, the way we, when we're going to see the butterflies at the middle or very close, you know, how they fly everywhere. So that's how they used to fly in Macheros when I was little. But things when, um, I, I think, the, pop uh, really the population then. went down, I think. And so it's really hard to see that anymore in Macheros, you know, but that, that's when I, when I was little, you know, mm -hmm. I used to see the butterflies. Although two years ago, you kept saying that this is like what it was like when I was a kid. Two years ago, there were there was a very good population, um, probably better than what the numbers actually said. Is what it seemed like to us, and we saw a lot of butterflies flying around Macheros in the valley. There just there were so many butterflies. Some of that may be the result of yeah, they're so well up on the mountain. Chris, you could take me out, and make that and make that picture bigger if you want. I'll show a couple of photos. Some of that may be the the protection and the milkweed and the efforts in the U.S., but some of it may also be. Um, oh, Christy, if you want to put up my slideshow, I'll I'll show a few of these photos. Um, do you have that signal? Yeah. Um, it also is. You guys are working down there to stop logging. I mean, there's threats on both ends, um, and that's actually there's a photo if people can see it. That's the entrance to Macheros, and I'll let it go full screen screen here that, that beautiful little gate and it just gets prettier this town is so extraordinary and this is let me show a couple of pictures can you guys see these photos yeah we can yeah. Hoel, can you see the photos yeah so, yeah, so, so yeah. Could, uh, 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's the, so that's the actual welcome sign for for tourists who want to come and they show up. They run a horse from somebody in town. Yeah. Yep. There's there are about seventy guys who have have horses that that they, they rent. There there are fewer horses. Most of them have two horses. There are some of the horses, and uh, yeah, it's a rotating list so that it spreads out the income from butterfly tourism to families in the town. We go down the list when you when you go see butterflies. There's the church in the background behind. Uh, here's our friend Eric Weber. I don't know if Eric's watching right now. Eric, you can throw up a comment if you are. But there's Eric riding up the, the mountain and um, wearing a mask, but not because of COVID. Just It had been a little dry and dusty. And um, I just thought people would enjoy. What, one thing that I find when I try to tell people how great the butterflies are to be there and see them and experience it is this. I don't know, Hoel, how many times have you been up the mountain? Hundreds, probably. Oh, thousands. <laughs> so, but every time you go, I look at you, and every time I go, it's like you're there for the first time. You're, you're, I, you're just yeah, every time, you know, um, that I'm going to see the butterflies, it's a different experience, you know. It's like I never get tired to see the butterflies, you know. Like, it's just I keep telling people, you know, it's the energy of the butterflies. I don't know to see so many butterflies all together, you know, just, uh, I don't know. I can control myself. I just, something that makes me happy. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. There, there's Christy and I with you, a uh, picture from a few yeah. years ago. There's a comment there. I'm having a hard time seeing the comments right now uh, from Lena. What was Lena? Uh, Jennifer's question is, um, what time of year should we put out our milkweed planting? So I guess that's a question for me. It's mm -hmm. tricky. My milkweed tends to come back after the migration. Uh, that's a great question, Lena. I'm going to go to the next photo here while I'm answering it. The um, the uh, oh, I love that photo. The the nice thing it's tricky up here with the milkweed because if we have a late if it's cool in February, then the milkweed doesn't you know hasn't put a lot of leaves on yet by the time the monarchs get here. And so the timing of the migration is is really critical. Of course, the idea is that there needs to be milkweed from northern Mexico all the way, well, all the way north, but for that first generation, all the way through central Texas and the hill country. So some years when the timing is right, we have a lot of leaves on our milkweed here. But the, the best time to plant really is in the, in the spring. If you're going to be really careful and mulch and take care of them now, you can plant milkweed now um, in Austin, Natural Gardener and Martin Springs Nursery both have milkweed in stock. And plant it now and take really good care of it. It'll establish roots. And then by next spring, it should be putting on a lot of growth. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, challenge down there um, on this end planting, but the challenge down there has been it, the butterflies have to be insulated against the cold by the trees. So what have you guys found? Uh, uh, I know that logging has been an issue in the past and it's, and I think because of your work, it's getting better, but tell us about the, the logging situation. Yeah, it's an, it's an ongoing issue. And I, I think it's going to be even more of a challenge right now with the economic crash that's already hitting us. You know, I, I think for a lot of people have been returned to their villages around here, people who were working in Mexico city or Cancun lost their jobs. So yeah. Yeah. So, so common thing I mean, we see with these with our, these programs we've been doing is that the local people, it's really important that local people benefit by the by the conservation tourism and they and have by to the be part of the efforts that are funded as well. Yes. Yeah. By the money so, that's been spent on conservation, which does not reach these communities as far as I can see, yeah, as far as so, we can see. Have to so ask what, anyone who here about that. No, yeah. but, you know, like, um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, you know. But um, with the project, you know, we helping people. They used to do illegal logging, and I totally understand why, because um, it wasn't that much to do. You know, like the only way to support the families is just to go into cut a tree. So now uh, we have some. Uh, um, the people that protect the forest, you know, they, they used to do illegal logging, so now they protect the forest. So it's, um, we can see the difference in their families, you know, it's like, 
and and really the the forest the the forest health did improve a lot the first year we started this project it's called butterflies and their people it's butterflies and their people.org we just started a new fundraising campaign yesterday to keep the guys up there we now have six workers and yes three of them used to cut trees and now they don't the first year they started work logging dropped dramatically on Cerro Pallone. In 2018, it really, there, you know, more than 100 trees. We were down to like 19 trees that year. It went up the following year, not up to 100, but, you know, 38, I think. And this year, we're already hitting that number, and we're only halfway through the year. And it's really, it's, you know, it's making us pretty nervous just because I think there's so much more stress. And cutting down a tree is something people can do close to home. And there's always a market for wood, right? People are always doing construction. People are always building furniture. And there's really no one else guarding the forest apart from the state park system of the state of Mexico. It's called Sepanaf. They have three rangers there. Joel's dad was one of them. And now his brother, Patricio, Pato Moreno. Some of you might be friends with him on Facebook. He's got a lot of friends. He's a you know very good photographer, too. Um, and yeah, there are three safe enough rangers, and now there are six butterflies and their people forest guardians up there. But it's going to be really challenging, especially if we don't get a lot of tourism next year, which is not seeming very likely that it'll necessarily be safe for people to travel to see the butterflies probably into, you know, 2021. It's not, it's just not clear yet. Um, yeah. Fingers, so crossed we, fingers crossed that we have a vaccination, you know, in December or January. And so, uh, you know, many of us will be able to, to jump in down there. And there will be people in the U.S. who have had uh, the virus and have positive antibodies and aren't susceptible. To, to, we will hope by then it'll be shown that they're not susceptible mm -hmm. to the virus anymore. And, and those people may be able to come and visit. So, but in the meantime, yeah. people... We're very <laughs> spread out. <laughs> Christy, do you, you have a piece of uh, video that w that we could uh, Ellen could narrate a little bit? Yes, about butterflies and their people. If you're able to put that up, we saw Christy on screen a little while ago. She's uh, uh, doing everything behind the scenes here, and this is a video uh, that Ellen and Hoel made about butterflies and their people. Well. I think we've we've taken the audio out, so Ellen can just add anything she wants to add as it plays. Yeah, so there are four sanctuaries. Two are in the state of Mexico and two are in Michoacan. People say the butterflies go to Michoacan. Not entirely true. We get a lot of them in the state of Mexico also. You can see the map there. We're on the bottom of that yellow area there is where Cerro Pallon is, the southern part of the Biosphere Reserve. Here's some legal logging. They're out and about in the day cutting down trees, which is why I changed this slide to just logging because another issue we have is that not only is that they're illegal logging, there is legal logging happening around and in the sanctuaries as well. That's up in the core protected area near Carditos. And you know those guys. Yeah, so without without an intact forest cover, there you know, with there's a snowstorm, if there's hot weather, it doesn't keep them cool. Um, yeah. So here are the guys. Here are our first three: Osvaldo, Carmelo, and Pancho. And one of our newest tires is on the far right there, Emilio. He's actually from the state of Mexico also. So yes, we had forest protection was safe enough for years, but they were all from the state of Mexico. So part of what we've done is, is hire people from the state of Michoacan from those communities as well. And it's those communities that do most of the logging, the illegal logging on Cerro Pallone. Um, so I have garbage up there. A lot of it is from reforestation projects. That's a request the guys have. If you're funding reforestation, please make sure they pick up their garbage after they do it. They help a little bit with reforestation, but I'd say that's not really our main emphasis. I'd really rather keep the trees in the ground than plant new ones. This little tree, you can't even see it. It's gonna take 30 years before a butterfly can use that. We don't have 30 years. So, 
Kind of strangely, officially, we're not allowed to look at butterflies with the guys up there. So we're, we're allowed to look at mushrooms, flowers, and birds. There's some of their pictures. But they do, of course, look at butterflies, help out, keeping an eye on the colony, keeping tourists from getting too close, trying to keep people from stepping on them, yelling at them, taking them home. So and I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump in here because we're about twenty seconds ahead of you. Because Ellen and and Noel are watching, are talking to us on a cell phone. They have the Facebook delay, uh, so the the video is a, a few seconds behind. Um, uh -oh. That when, when that's all fine. That's just built into the system. If um, one of the challenges of being in the field. Um, the uh, butterfliesandtheirpeople.org, we hope everybody will get out there and, and we'll go and make a donation at the website. We'll show, we'll show another piece of video at the end, which has that link again. Um, the Novelli Project is, is a partner there in, uh, with one of the rangers, and we, we helped to sponsor. And uh, we hope that our friends and supporters uh, will do the same. There's a lot of people watching that are also uh, just fans of Butterflies and Their People. I saw a... Uh, from I think it was from Kaylee. I'm not sure it ran by, but it said one of the cool things about uh, Cerro Pallone is that's where, if people who remember the uh, you know, National Geographic reported back in the 70s uh, that the the winter colonies of the monarchs had finally been discovered. Of course, people in Mexico knew they were there, but in the rest of North America, the monarchs came and went through the season, and we knew there was some kind of migration, and they headed south, but no one really knew where they went. So it was a huge discovery when, when they were found on top of the mountain at Cerro Pelon. Joel, what did the people in Mexico, they didn't, down there, you didn't know the butterflies flew all the way to, to Canada. What did people in, uh, in the mountains there, what, what did they believe about the butterflies? Uh, well, um, because they arrived the day of the dead, um, I hear, I'm not sure, you know, like sometimes you ask people, but um, they used to believe it was the soul of the dead people. They come to visit them because they come every year, like the day of the dead. So, yeah, um, I don't know if they still believe that anymore. Or, like older people, you ask them and some people, I think they didn't even pay attention about the butterflies before, you know. They were just yeah. there. Some yeah. people thought they had to yeah. out of the trees themselves. Yeah. Other people thought they were a plague, an infestation. Well, that's what my aunt says. Yes. I, I didn't know why I've she heard that, that from more than one person. We just yeah. did an oral history project, so that's what we heard. That's wild. Mm -hmm. That is wild. Uh, I'm going to reload my uh, other page here. Christy, I don't know if you have my, my video or not. And um, we were continuing to go here. So the, another thing I want to mention before before we uh, go too far, while we're talking about butterflies and their people, the Novelli Project, of course, we're an education and conservation nonprofit. And um, I don't know why Christy seems to have lost that that signal, um, my, my, my image signal. You could try the other one, Christy. You want me to look at the other camera? Because we're an education and conservation nonprofit. A lot of people know us for building classrooms and libraries in, in Kenya. So we're working with Hoel and Ellen. Um, Butterflies and their people to um, to build a uh, finish a classroom at the high school of Macheros now. Mm -hmm. uh, Christy, do yeah. you have? I seem to have lost Christy completely. I'm still in the audio in the feed. If you have um, if you have my slideshow, we can show some photos of the kids here and see what we can get up. Chuck, I'm sorry, I can only get you audio only. What would would you like to see this um, video you, of you and Hoel alone, or? Uh, can you see my slideshow? Here. Can we have yeah. the high school? So while, uh, while Christy, we'll see if we can get the slideshow up there. Yeah, we just talk about the, the high school is something new to Macheros. Macheros did not have a high school until a couple of years ago and they were operating out of an old shoe factory that was very leaky. And they did get money from the state to build uh, classrooms for their new high school, but it's three grades in the high school. So it's like 10th, 11th and 12th grade. And somehow by the time it got built, there are only two classrooms, but three grades. So it's been really great that the Nobility Project has stepped in to finish a third classroom so that each grade can now have its own class and the teachers and the students will be very happy. It's still very small. Most classes only have nine or 10 
or 12 students in it, most kids drop out before they get to high school still. Um, the level of education around the sanctuaries is still very low, but it's a, it's a beginning and a huge, you know, uh, progress for Materos that we've become really the educational center of our ajito where kids go to go to school. Fantastic. And and that's you know that. I'm going um, to reload the site. Uh, we'll see what happens. I think we'll all be back in a second, but we might take a, so we might a take breath. A two two seconds okay. here. I'll keep talking while Christy reloads and see if they'll start to work better. Um, yeah, the, uh, we hope next year, uh, if um, I'm still in audio there, we hope next year to, um, and Christy, if you need to, you can go ahead and play this last piece of video. Now, this is a video with me and Hoel. Let's watch this. We, we've heard a little bit of Hoel's story, but I just thought this is a little more of the experience of being up on the mountain. This was from this winter. And... Oh, you so can, we haven't seen that. You can oh, hear the wings of the butterflies. So, so these uh, colonies, this colony was farther up a, a week or two ago. Uh, yeah. Um, when the butterflies arrive, they arrive on the highest point and they start to move closer. Oh, they're going low, closer to the top, so, would you say? These, uh, um, yeah, so this colony just moved here. The colony, so this colony was farther up a, a week or two ago. Away. Uh, yeah. Half of them still higher. Yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of trees covered here, though. Yeah, well, we're here. It's not even half. When the butterflies arrive, they arrive on the highest point, and they start to move. My dad, he was a forest ranger. He's still around, you know. But uh, I don't know. I think he started to work when I when I born. That's when he started to protect the butterflies. So. The this forest, so I really don't remember when was the first time. Um, like I told people, I, I want to thank the probably my dad put me in the back in his horse and took me to see the butterflies. So it's beautiful, you know. Uh, after you get tired of this, it's like um, the energy to be here uh, at the butterflies. You know, it's, something that you cannot explain you know it's just beautiful So, so we've got a comment online about the uh, from uh, Lally uh, saying that um, reminding us that the, the butterflies and on the sanctuaries they need the old growth. These are OML fir trees, and they need the really old growth trees for them to cluster around and uh, to protect themselves. They they by clustering so close together that's what helps to keep them warm through the cold weather and it, it can be very cold there and the trees are cut the butterflies can. can you hear us i can hear you i can yep. hear you fine but can you hear us we can so when the trees are cut we're, we're going to wrap it up soon and i wanted to ask you a question about the problem with with logging if the trees are cut too many trees yeah. are cut then the cold weather can get to the butterflies correct Yes, we, we had a big storm in March of 2016 where there was an ice storm and it already it just it kind of proved that that uh, the forest was not able to act like a protective blanket and keep the temperature stable where the butterflies were and 37 percent of them froze to death like it, it, you know, already the forest structure has been compromised and I, you know, I think we just can't can't keep doing that, you know, they we see the butterflies cluster on two different sides of Cerro Pallone on, in Michoacan, where they didn't have forest protection for most of this time until we've started recently, it's newer growth trees. There's a much higher mortality rate on that side of the sanctuary. The forest floor is covered with dead butterflies. When they're on the state of Mexico side, where Hoel's dad and the 
the other two rangers were working for the last 40 years before, there's a lot lower mortality rate because they're on old growth trees that keep them warmer because they act like a, it's called, you know, the hot water bottle effects that they, they protect them. Yeah. yeah. So all, all the more reason to have these uh, forest guardians up there um, making sure that people aren't cutting and hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that we get some tourism going again. And uh, and that money comes back into the community as well. But in the meantime, I really uh, hope everybody can support butterflies and their people and can, can share this message. Uh, I want to thank the two of you. We, we've got through some challenges here, but we seem to, to have gotten there. We have one more. Uh, we have one more piece of video about butterflies and their people we want to play. I want to thank everybody, remind them that all of our summer camp safaris uh, are available on our on the Novelty Project's Facebook page uh, from on, on the uh, northern white rhinos, on elephants, on lions, mountain gorillas, and now butterflies. Um, thanks, so Ellen Ellen. Let's watch this uh, video about butterflies and their people. I hope to see you guys soon. Every fall, millions of monarch butterflies migrate from as far away as Canada to overwinter on a few acres of forest in central Mexico. The monarch's Mexican neighbors are poor. Many cut down trees in the butterfly sanctuary to get by. Nonprofit Butterflies and Their People employs six locals to patrol the Sara Pallone Sanctuary. Logging dropped when they started work in 2018, but the recent recession has led to a rise in clandestine logging and we can no longer count on butterfly tourism to bolster the local economy this winter. Visitors are no, the monarchs will be back in November and they will need their trees. An intact forest protects the monarch colonies from the elements. Butterflies and their people need your help to keep paying locals to patrol the butterfly forest during these difficult times. Don't let deforestation destroy the monarch migration. Please donate what you can to protect this natural wonder for posterity. For more information, visit butterfliesandtheirpeople.org. to make a contribution. Uh, we've made one before, but we'd like to add an additional $500 contribution to butterflies and their people. We'd hope that our viewers would match that or maybe m way more than match that. Um, uh, it's it's going to take a lot to make this work happen. Um, and the same thing is we're, we're throwing some support out there to the other groups that we've worked with and hope every, everyone else will too. Uh, we don't want conservation to fall by the wayside while we're dealing with other problems in the world. So thank you, Hoel and Ellen and everyone who loves the monarchs, plants the milkweed, make a donation to support butterflies and their people. Bye. <laughs>